And this should be part two and the last part of Who Are the True Christians? A um, question, of course, always comes up with Christian people as to who are the um, people who are actually the true Christians. Who are the believers? We know the end of the age is a time of uh, great and terrible deception. In fact, in Matthew 24, as you know, that the deception is to come primarily from those who come in the name of Christ. And as we read the parable of the sower from which we're obtaining our lesson in uh, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, we find that all of the people indicated in this parable are people who have heard the word of the kingdom. They've heard it even for a short time, or some of them apparently hear it all their lives. These are not talking about the heathen, about people in other countries that have never heard the word of God. This parable is about those who have heard the word of God. Now, last week we ended in Luke 8 and verse 13. I think we'll repeat that again. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. And I think I'll repeat my reminder again that this is an obvious statement that they heard the word of God, they were glad to hear it, they did believe for a while and then they turned away. And as we saw from the meaning of the word temptation, which is the same word used in explaining the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a temptation by the devil quoting scripture and trying to get you to do or believe something that is false. In effect, that's what we saw the devil did with the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't uh, deny that Jesus was the Christ. In fact, he even said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. In other words, do something because of something the Scripture says, but you do it in error. And uh, I read from this magazine, which I'm going to repeat again, the statement by the man who supposedly had been saved, and he said to the people who supposedly saved him, quote, I doubt if I could ever have been persuaded by Bible argument alone, but I was convinced by the personal experiences of those businessmen. In other words, the admission in the magazine and by the man was that he was not converted by the word of God, but he was converted by the word of men. And this is uh, the thing that we find multiplied millions of people across the Christian world have been converted to believe something by words of men rather than believe the truth by the word of God. Now this, of course, is a fulfillment of prophecy, so turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul, writing to this preacher, said to him, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed, and that means listening to and believing, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In Second Timothy, in chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. In other words, you, re you reprove and tell people the truth. Doctrine, God's doctrine is truth. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Now this is exactly what the parable of the sower said. They will hear the word, they may even believe, and then they'll turn away, and of course Paul explains that in turning away they shall be turned unto fables. And of course fables are untruths, something that people believe, but that which is false. It's not the truth of God. Now, uh, in relating, relating to this man who said he was converted by the testimonies of men, we have an example of what the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the 19th chapter of Revelation. And the angel, of course, was giving the instruction to John and giving him this vision and then explained the vision. And uh, in verse 9 of Revelation 19, he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now all of this vision and this... Uh, explanation the angel had been giving John so impressed him that he, according to the next verse, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. 
I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, multiplied millions of people attend churches, and they have the erroneous belief that someone has the testimony of Jesus, when the truth of the matter is they have the testimonies of men. He says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy and is to get you to do one thing, believe God. And when you believe God, that means you believe the truth in God's word. If what you believe is a falsehood, you're not believing according to the testimony of Jesus, you're believing according to doctrines of devils and the testimonies of men. Now in uh, John 15, and I want to read just a few verses about the Holy Spirit so we understand what Jesus Christ taught that the Spirit of God was to do to believers. In John 15 and verse 26, he says, But when the Comforter, and of course the Comforter is identified as the Spirit several times in this John 14, 15, 16, and 17. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. And John 16, the very next chapter, as he continues explaining the Holy Spirit to them, in verse 13 he says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. In other words, the Holy Spirit was to do three specific things in that, those verses. He would guide you, you believers, into all truth. He would not speak of himself, and he will show you things to come. And of course, in the previous chapter, Christ said the Holy Spirit would testify of Jesus. And this is one of the things that Christian people are seduced by to a great extent. They have the erroneous belief that the Holy Spirit testifies of himself. And I have heard and you have heard sermon after sermon after sermon on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not preach about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit preaches the truth. He preaches of things to come which would fit the testimony of Jesus in Revelation 19 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And if you'll read Isaiah 43 through Isaiah 48, there are about five or six chapters, and God gives the prophet Isaiah to repeat over and over in perhaps a score of different ways that the one proof of God is that God can tell the future. And in fact, he uh, gives a challenge to all the other gods of the world to tell the future. Now the devil and all the other gods of the world can masquerade by doing miracles which people think are from God. And if you'll read the book of Exodus, you'll find that when Moses threw down the rod and it changed to a snake, that the magicians in Pharaoh's house also threw down their rods and they turned into snakes, right? You see, we believe miracles. We believe the things our eyes see. And we're looking for signs and wonders. And the devil has millions of them. And he does all these things and they're false. And the scripture tells us one thing. You believe God. You believe the Word. Let's go back to John 8. Our Christ was speaking to the Pharisees here. And let's see what he said about these people and about the devil. John 8 and verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, if people believe lies, according to this, apparently the devil is the father of lies. So if lies are taught to people, regardless of whether they taught to people in the name of Christ or not, their origin must be the devil, because he's the father of lies here, according to this. Now turn over to the letter by John in 1 John. And I apologize for turning you back and forth in the Bible so much, but I have to pick out uh, some of these verses that state specifically of the origin of the lies which people will turn to when they turn away from God's word or the truth. 
1 John, second chapter, and verse 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Now just think for a moment. What that means in very simple English words is that no lie can possibly come from the Word of God. God. Christ said to the Father when he prayed, Thy word is truth. This word is truth and no lie can come from this Bible. We had the amazing thing, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, of talking personally to a preacher who in effect admitted to us that it was probably not true that there was a secret rapture, but that the preaching of the secret rapture brought people in and got them saved. Brother, sister, that man doesn't know his Bible. Because the Bible says, according to this letter from John, because you know it and that you know the truth, and that no lie is of the truth. You can't pick a lie out of the Bible, preach it as if it's just a mistake or an error, and say, well, that comes from the Bible. No. It comes from the devil, and John or Paul called them devil doctrines, and that's exactly what they are. In verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And did you ever stop to think for a moment that one of the most ingenious and effective and devilish ways to deny Jesus Christ and the Father is to deny the law and the prophets? You don't have to get up and say, well, I don't believe in Jesus. In fact, the devil did not j deny Jesus Christ was the Son of God. The Scripture tells us that devils believe and tremble. One of the uh, devils that was cast out by the Lord Jesus Christ called him the Son of God. Devils know who God is, and devils can get up in pulpits and proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God and turn around and preach you a lie. Does that make them a Christian? No, it makes them a minister of the devil because they're preaching falsehood to God's Israel people. And when they deny the law and the prophets, in other words, part of God's word, they are in effect, and very effectively, by the way, denying Jesus Christ and the Father because they're teaching lies and teaching errors. He goes on in this, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that, that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Now those two verses are often read alone. And they say, well, that means that anyone who says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God is the Father of Jesus, regardless of what else they say, if that's all they say, that's enough and they're Christians. But let's read the next verse. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. Now what in the world could they have heard from the beginning except the word of God that he was referring to. And then he says, if. Now this is a big if. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now let's think of the parable for a moment. The parable told us that the seed that fell on uh, the stony places believed for a while, and then when temptation and trouble and trials came along, turned away. Turned away to what? Well, Paul explains they turn away to fables. Now, uh, John says here that if, and I'm going to read that again, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. I raised this question last week. What is this doctrine about once saved, always saved? Here we have a parable that teaches rather plainly and is verified by this letter of John that there must be some people who do not retain the word of God and the truth but turn to lies. Well, and what is John saying here? He's saying, in effect, that if you don't retain that which you had from the beginning, which was the truth as he explained in previous verses, then you will not continue in the Son or in the Father. Now, let's be careful. In fact, uh, one of the big problems of our young people in the churches today is that they are preached primarily by evangelists who tell them that all they have to do is come down in front of the altar and confess Christ and they'll be saved and uh, they just leave them. And I've talked to some of these young people and they go back to that same church 
or another church, and the next Sunday they hear the same sermon over again. And the next Sunday they hear the same sermon. 52 weeks out of the year for 20 years, all they ever hear is that all you have to do is confess Christ and be saved. There's no instruction. There's no wisdom. There's no telling them what the law is. There's no telling them what they shouldn't do and what they should do. There's no explanation of what a Christian is. And eventually what happens to them? You know what happens to them. That article I read last week said that 90% of the college students in America do not go to church. Now, according to the uh, church statistics themselves, that 55% of the American families belong to a church. That means that at least half of the church-going families lose their children by the time they're college age, right? There's something wrong with the doctrine that is taught in a church where the young people are, half of them are gone by the time they're 20 years old. And they listen to this thing and they do not hear what God has to tell them and the truth of the matter. And uh, this secret rapture doctrine, by the way, to me is one of the great examples of one of the most devilish doctrines that has ever been taught in the Christian church. And I was telling one young man the other day that a lady called me from Tucson some year ago or so and asking for help that the church they attended, the minister taught that the secret rapture of the Christians was so near that the young fellow quit, quit his college and turned away from the university. No point in getting an education because Christ had come and take him away tomorrow or next week or something like that. And the young man I was telling to this to spoke up and said, well, he says, that's why I don't have a college education. And I wouldn't be surprised that there are hundreds of thousands of young people all across this land who have given up upon living a normal, righteous life and said, well, it's going to be all over next week or so anyway. Let the world go to pot. I'm leaving. And brother, sister, the world's going to pot. And I would say this. If the doctrine of the secret rapture had been taught and believed by the pilgrims and the Puritans in England, they never would have left England and founded this great kingdom nation. The devil has destroyed the works of more Christian people and churches by that doctrine than any other individual doctrine that I can think of. People quit thinking of the world. They quit thinking of the word. They quit doing their Christian work and witness and making a Christian nation of the nation and sit back and wait to be taken off the earth. And what more could the devil ask for than the whole group of Christian people sitting here doing nothing to forestall his evil purposes and his conquest of the earth by waiting to leave this earth. Brother, sister, the battle for the kingdom is the battle for this earth. And that doctrine takes these Christian soldiers out of the battle. And according to John, he said that if you do not retain these things which were from the beginning, you have not the Son and you have not the Father. And I would remind you that the doctrine of the secret rapture of the church is less than 200 years old. It is not something that was taught by the apostles. It was never taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not taught by the reformers in the 1400s, 1500s, and 1600s. The teaching of the great doctrines that turned literally the entire continent of Europe to Christians, to become Christians, was not the doctrine of the secret rapture. It was the doctrine of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God upon the earth. And I don't have that newspaper article, but would you bring that up? I want to read that right now to some of you folks who haven't seen this. This is Billy Graham's column, and perhaps some people will believe this now that Billy Graham has mentioned this, as long as I'm on the subject of the founding of the United States of America. Someone wrote to Billy Graham and asked him, if God dealt with nations, that he had always heard that God dealt only with individuals. Well, Billy Graham answered that since nations are comprised of people, yes, God deals with nations and so on. And amazingly enough, in the last part of this answer by Billy Graham, he says this. First he says, I believe we can assume God has an interest in the nations of the world. And then he says, Before the pilgrims left Europe for the new world, their spiritual leader Reverend John Robinson read these words from the Bible, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Genesis 12.2 What was 
the consequence of teaching the truth of God's word? These people came to a miracle of believing they were the beginning of the establishment of the kingdom of God upon the earth. Just imagine. And John Robinson, as some of you may know, was the pastor in Holland, the pastor of the people who came over on the Mayflower. He didn't come on the Mayflower, he came later, but he was their preacher over there. And when they left, he said, he quoted Genesis 12 too. Just imagine if John Robinson and the rest of these preachers had been preaching the rapture of the church as we hear it today. Do you think those people would have gotten in that little old sailing boat and spent six weeks on the stormy North Atlantic to go to build the great nation? Nonsense. The devil would have destroyed their work with this lies before they'd ever gotten it started. And yet today, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, and the Pentecostal churches all preach that all we're waiting for is the removal of the Christians from off the earth. One of the greatest devil doctrines that has ever been taught in any church. All right, let's go back to Luke 8 again. For we read that These have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that falling away, I believe, is very simply the falling away to lies. All right, let's read the next part of this parable in all three of the Gospels, Matthew 13 and verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word in the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. This didn't say that he quit going to church, did it? No, it said the cares of this world make him unfruitful. Mark 4, verses 18 and 19 tell the same one about the thorns, the seed among the thorns. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. Now you'll notice in Matthew it said that the person becomes unfruitful. In uh, Mark the same story says that it, or the word, becomes unfruitful. And then in uh, Luke 8 and verse 14, And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Now, I would say this, that as a preacher, I assume that I do, as many other preachers do, preach to an awful lot of people who hear the word, and they listen to it perhaps all of their life, but they never bring any fruit to perfection. And as uh, a preacher who does a lot of his preaching by tape and by mail and by writing, you recognize a lot of these people I never meet. And sometimes the only evidence that I have of their sincerity as Christians is what they do with God's tithe money. Do they pay God's tithe money to the preaching of the word or do they keep it for themselves? Well, I suppose I must be preaching at least to some people who are literally as the seed among the thorns because apparently many people do teach or do keep rather all of their tithes or God's tithes for themselves and the cares of this world and the things of this world prevent them from ever bringing anything to perfection. And what a sad uh, thing to say about someone who has heard the word of God all of his life. And in each case, notice, it doesn't say he quit hearing the word of God. This on thorny ground, he heard the word. And what a sad thing to say in that last part of verse 14 of chapter 8 of Luke. And bring no fruit to perfection. Nothing results sometimes from a lifetime of listening to the Word of God. Because while they sit in church, they're concerned about what they're supposed to do at work tomorrow, or perhaps they're running a business and they have to hire some people tomorrow, and the thoughts of the world go through their head all the time that I or some other minister am trying to preach the Word of God to them. And so the things of the world. Now this isn't say, doesn't say they turn around and believe false doctrine, It doesn't even say that the devil comes along and takes the doctrine away from him. It says that the things of the world itself, outside here, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, just ruin what was preached on Sunday. So uh, just take that as a warning. 
that God expects and preaches and teaches in this parable that these people who will not do what the Word of God says but do hear it bring no fruit to perfection. Now I want to read the last part of this and this is primarily about you people. So we finally got down to most of the people that will be listening to this sermon because there are some other people. Verse 23 of Matthew 13, But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. And I would remind you this is the first time in the parable that the word understandeth it is used. Apparently every one of the rest of the people we've talked about in the first part of this parable did not understand the word of the kingdom. Now we finally came to those who did. They received it on good ground. And understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And look at the multiplication and the harvest that comes from understanding the word of God. In Mark 4, in uh, verse uh, 20, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And here we see they receive the word. Luke 8 and verse 15, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Now you'll notice in each one of these cases they use a different thing. In one place they receive it, in one they keep it, in one they understand it. What have these people retained that the rest of them have not but the Word of God? That's the only difference between the seed on the stony ground or the seed among thorns or the seed among the wayside. The only difference is that those who have received it on good ground receive the Word, believe it, and understand it. And um, if any of you would consider and think that we have more Christian churches in America per capita than any other nation in the world. We have more Christian ministers than any other nation in the world or people. And yet, take a look at this country. Is it bearing the fruit of the Word of God or is it bearing the fruit of the work of the devil? This nation has changed in the last hundred years from a nation where crime and criminality was practically non-existent to a situation today where my own state government is now considering legislation where the parole board will be authorized to release from prison any person regardless of his crime after he has served one year in the penitentiary. And that includes murder and rape and everything else. And why are they doing this? They are getting so many criminals in our state that the people who are running the prisons and the law enforcement offices are literally do not know what to do with criminals except to turn them loose on society. If they put all the criminals in jail in this state and tried to keep them there, we'd have to build a dozen new prisons instead of the two that we now have. And where is this happening? This is happening in a place that has more preaching and more ministers and more churches and more Bibles per capita than any other nation on the face of the globe. And the only thing that I can say is there must be something wrong with the Word and what's happening to the people who receive it. The fruit of the kingdom is being brought forth by literally by a handful of people. Let's turn over to John 15 again. In the Gospel, John 15 and verse 7. Christ said to the apostles, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Just think of the promise. Now you know we're supposed to pray in the Spirit and in the will of God. Well, it's God's will that his Israel people turn and repent and he will heal their land. And he says to us, and he speaks to us as his disciples and apostles, that if we abide in him and my words, what abide in you? The word of God. 
There's only one thing that can do anything inside of you that will bring forth fruit, and that's the Word of God. If you want devil doctrines, if you want to refuse to believe the Word, if you want to just listen to it and never try to understand it, you're not going to have Jesus Christ abiding in you. Jesus Christ cannot abide in you in this vessel if you refuse to have his word. I don't know where we got this erroneous idea that all we have to do is accept Jesus Christ. No, we have to have his word living in us. And I could preach another sermon on who Jesus Christ is, but I hope that most of you recognize that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament too. It was Jesus Christ who gave the Spirit to these men who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which most Christian people want to throw away. Now that's the Word of Christ in the book of Exodus, in the book of Genesis, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Isaiah. It's not the Word of some strange God. It's the words of Christ. And He says, If this abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. God will provide those people who believe in him whatever is necessary to bring forth fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. That's the purpose. Verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. How in the world can the United States of America and even the missionaries who go to foreign countries glorify the Father in the eyes of the heathen when back here in America there's no fruit? fit for the kingdom. The heathen can't see anything good about America anymore. To them, we're just a bunch of exploiters and white racists and everything under the sun. But if they saw this nation as Christian believers and doing what God says in this nation, they would be fascinated and they would believe and they would come to us to find out what we have that they would like to have. And Christ said, My Father is glorified that ye bear much fruit, so, or in that manner, in the bearing of the fruit, shall ye be my disciples. Now, brother, we're not going to bear the fruit without having the Word of God. Turn over to a letter of John's now, the first letter. In John 5, let's start in the first verse. 1 John 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that, begot, that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. What in the world could he mean other than that we believe and obey the commandments of that are also in the Old Testament. You want to be a Christian? You want to believe that Jesus Christ is born of God? You obey His commandments and believe them. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Is the evidence of the love of God to go out and proclaim what a great Christian you are and how much you love the Lord Jesus Christ? And I hear this. I don't know whether you folks listen to the radio, Christian radio, as much as I do, but once in a while I turn it on in the morning and different stations. We have three Christian stations in Phoenix now, by the way. And uh, one of the things that I hear are some of these men talking about over and over and over all they want to talk about is the Holy Spirit and how much they love Jesus. No, he said, if you want to see evidence of the love of God, see who's obeying the commandments of God. And his commandments are not grievous, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Remember in the parable that the world overcame the people where the seed fell on stony grounds and the cares of this world overcame them. No, Christians are those who overcome the world, not those who are overcome by the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that dwelleth, believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And verse 19, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and has given us 
the ability to shout how much we love the Lord Jesus Christ. doesn't say that, does it? You know, this one word has caused, I suppose, more Christian people to misunderstand what the Bible is all about than any other one. They don't want understanding. They say, I want faith. I just want to be, have faith in Jesus. And what does it say here about the Son of God is come? We know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding. You want to know who the true Christians are? True Christians are those who believe and understand the Word of God. If you talk to someone who attends church and has no understanding of the Word of God, doesn't know a thing that what the Word teaches or preaches, doesn't know a thing about the books of the Old Testament, brother, sister, you're not talking to much of a Christian. I have been amazed in the last several years, quite a few years now, that when people find out and understand the word of the kingdom, and remember in Matthew 13, the beginning of the parable, the seed is the word of the kingdom. That when Christian people begin to understand not just have faith that this is the Bible. We know this is the Bible that says on the front, Holy Bible. It doesn't take a lot of faith to know that, does it? But if you have the understanding of the Word of God, I have been amazed and happy and glad to hear it of the people who write and tell me just an indication in their letter of how much time they spend listening to or reading the Word of God every week. And that's why I mentioned earlier, people are buying these cassette recorders so they can carry them in the car. So they can listen to the Word of God going to work. They can listen to the Word of God at the noon hour. They can listen to the Word of God in the way home from work. And then they can go to some church if they have one where the Word of God is preached and listen to the Word of God. And then they have their friends over on one or two or three nights a week and they play more of these ser sermons. And they're not all Pastor Emery's. Many of these people get the sermons from two and three and four preachers. Eight and nine and ten hours a week of preaching that they hear. And they write and tell me that they listen to some of these sermons two and three and four and five times. Just one sermon. What is this? Well, these are the people where the seed fell on good ground. And brother, sister, that's good ground. And they want to hear the word of God that well. And Christ came and hath given us an understanding that we know him that is true and would to God. People will begin to understand that if there is something in the church that they attend that is false and has continued to be taught as, as if it were true, that that is not from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's from the devil, and the preacher is teaching devil doctrines. And Christ came to give us this understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And he ends it with one of the most fascinating short verses of Scripture in all of these letters. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. You know, if we believe and act upon the belief in a false doctrine, do you know what you're doing? You're worshiping an idol. You're worshiping the devil because anyone you believe and obey in that belief is the one you worship. And if you have turned away to devil doctrines and you believe them, you're not worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, you're worshiping Satan. Because that's his doctrine, not the doctrines of God. In the second epistle, John makes this rather plain as the individual is supposed to do. In verse 9 he said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. If he does not preach and believe the truth of the Holy Bible, which is the doctrine of Christ, he hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now abideth in means to live in, believe, have, not deny in any way, shape, or manner. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, and if you'll read the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus Christ went out to preach one thing, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. It's used interchangeably. 
He went out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, this doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. And if he preaches false doctrines which can only come from the father of lies, if you even give him money to help him preach them, you in effect are partaker of his evil deeds. Because there is nothing that is destroying our people more in this land than the preaching of false doctrines and the lies of the devil. And there is nothing that is going to save our people except the preaching of the truth of the Word of God. And brother, sister, you can't support the devil with 90% of your money and support Christ with the other 10% because you become partaker of the evil deeds of the false lies of the devil. Now that narrows this down a little bit. And I hope and pray that the time will soon come when the true Christians, the believers, will act upon what they believe instead of acting upon the devil's lies. And when this word is preached, we know the word of God is more powerful and it will sweep away all the lies in this land and then we'll turn to God and then God will heal the land through the word of truth. Let's all stand. Our Father, we thank you for this word of truth this thing that dispels all the untruths of the devil, all the doctrines that have been poured out upon our people by false prophets and false teachers. And Father, we pray that as Christian people, we search this word, we accept it, we believe it. And Lord, we pray for the great understanding of it that thou hast said in thy word that you came, you came to give to thy Israel people through the spirit that you put in them. And Father, we pray for the day when all shall be taught of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.